Chillin' ain't easy, but it's necessary I be getting weary, cause shit be getting scary But sit back, relax, and don't you dare worry Cause I be hitting wrongs with a righteous fury Yes sir, see, I am the only one My name is Josh Dunn, gonna have some fun Telling the truth, y'all can't handle I might raise a scandal as I dismantle The fake make them quake and make them shake I make you bend, but never will I make you break Just chill, yo, and don't be frightened Open that closed mind, it's time to get in light Welcome folks to Gimpin' Ain't Easy Cause It Ain't episode number 22. My goodness, it's been quite some time since we've done an episode, two and a half months or so. I guess that's what happens when you work for free sometimes. Other things uh, take precedence, but we're back, motherfuckers. It's so good to see you. And I guess I gotta tell you who we're, who we're brought to you by, don't, don't I? Well, this week, like always, we're brought to you once again by Charlie's Club, where most shots are 275 on Tuesdays, so even if you make some really bad choices, you won't go broke making it. This week we're also brought to you by Cafe Sempoil, where you'll meet all kinds of interesting characters from an even more interesting Sesame Street, including me. This week's feature book is an anthology on British literature that is near 3,000 pages long, and they're all onion skin and, and uh, small worded, so I'm going to try to make my way through it. So I say to that, eat your heart out, holy Bible. We're also brought to you this week by Lay's Brand Potato Chips. I bet you I can eat just one. Well, folks, uh, today... I was going to talk about my whole psychosis experience, but uh, before we get into that, I want to talk about what looks like another disability agency asking me to work for free. Now, I want to make uh, something clear that that it's not it's not absolute that this has happened, but it was suggested that this was a fundraiser for a group, and you know they wanted me to like spread the word and stuff, and I'm like. Man, come on, guys! I've never had any dealings with you guys. I can't, I can't spread the word about you if I don't know anything about you. And uh, I, I guess I hold these disability agencies to a higher standard than, say, something more uh, mainstream because I look at them to lead the example and uh, close the gap and actually pay us. You know, uh, show show that we're worth something. And um, more often than not, what they do is is teach very mundane sort of basic low level skills and and these cats are making living wages and so often not paying the disabled people that they're supposed to be representing and uh holding uh you, you know uh bringing up in society right so i want to i want to hold them to a higher standard and i say fuck maybe you should start finding these guys like 500 bucks for asking disabled people to work for free it's uh, it's shameful it's exploitative, especially if you're making a living wage off the organization. Even if it's not in the budget, go into your goddamn pocket, you dirty cowards. Nice. You ready to dip into the... Well, folks, uh, that little rant off my chest, I want to go into my psychosis. Uh, Some of you know that I I went through this in December, and I had it for like two months. And you have to forgive me, I I didn't prepare because uh, any notes or anything like that, because I I just wanted it to be uh, natural and authentic to the experience. Um, For those of you who don't know what psychosis means, um, I was seeing things and hearing voices things would appear to me in shadow things that weren't really there although to me they were very real and I've come to understand that it may be a brain malfunction but I also think like somehow a greater spiritual reality was opened up at one point I was able to connect with um one of my deceased grandfathers and his um 
his face appeared in shadow on the ceiling over my bed and and we were kind of communicating through uh, sensations in my back and I believe that shit is real as crazy as it sounds and uh, he was he was trying to help me I think through through all of that uh, mess and sort of sort of guide me through but uh, yeah what do you think about that 1942 can we connect with our ancestors it's possible it's possible yeah he's he's not too sure it's never happened to him so you didn't you, your your grandfather never appeared over your bed eh no no um how did how did you feel like when i was uh going through all this what what uh what kind of things were you thinking um i was mostly just worried that uh you were gonna come back right that was my biggest concern um yeah i just wanted it just you you were like the you that i know was gone and it was this uh just really odd other version of you like you were trapped in like a, a bad dream or something. Right. Uh, I do feel, folks, that my um, my personality was kind of trapped. Um, I was I was very slow. Um, my mind was processing things very slow, which um, doesn't doesn't happen to me. Uh, like I would I would still go to um, Sempwell sometimes, but I was like super sketched out and paranoid. And like hearing things and seeing things and stuff, so I could I'd like last for like fifteen minutes and then go back home and then like collapse on the floor um, because I was so tired. I think a big part of this was brought on by um, sleep deprivation, um, and but but most of the things that I saw in the shadows were bad. It was like they were they were demons, and um, I felt like I'd kind of opened up a portal to hell or something, and these demons were trying to get me, and they could blend with other people's energies, and uh, so that meant nobody was safe. And uh, at the worst of it, I thought, like, all my friends and family were going to be taken out, and that... Uh, that I'd even get like framed for the murder and killed myself and stuff like that. So it really felt like something was trying to uh, get at me and destroy uh, everything I had in life. And often when I'd, when I'd see somebody, I'd be uh, quite happy to see them and uh, reluctant for them to go because I thought it could be the last time I ever saw them. Any uh, any thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> I'm just sitting here. I'm just remembering all of that. That whole winter. That was a that was a wild winter, man. Yeah. Yeah, you'd uh, you'd quit the weed, and uh, so you were you were on a super straight edge uh, strongman journey there. Well, I'm glad I did, man. I needed I needed all my faculties to uh, to keep up. Yeah, to nav- what's going on. Yeah, to navigate that mess, eh? Like. Yeah, it was really good timing. Yeah, yeah, I think it was great timing, and I, I, um, I was kind of forced to quit the weed too because the doctors seemed to think that uh, my psychosis was at least in part um, marijuana induced. And uh, for those who don't know, I'm very sensitive to edibles. So uh, what I was doing leading up to that point was I was eating this uh, little bit of dispensary cream. Uh, went from back from when the dispensaries were still open and I was like uh, and I'd, I'd actually gotten sick on edibles before so I I got it down to like a really minute dose so I wasn't getting like sick or nauseous but I was being uh, like I was like blitzed for like fucking four hours a day and I was doing it twice a day so essentially I was high like eight hours a day I put in a, a shift of work getting stoned right <laughs> so I think that um, that really maybe wore on me after a while but Probably an even bigger part of that was uh, the sleep deprivation. I I hadn't slept, and I I, I was just all bugged out and um, and paranoid. And I mean, the things that were happening was was just wild. Like I remember um, going going to the hospital, and uh, I I escaped. But all I was doing was like walking back and forth up and down the commons because in shadow I would see these different paths on the ground so like one path would be like a plane to like go jump on a plane then like another path would be like some kind of like sketchy hand that was like trying to 
clutch and grab at my soul or something and another path would be like a gun and knife so I'd, I'd try to follow like the good path but it would be like shifting all the time so I was just like walking around in circles uh, trying to stay safe yeah I remember I was there yeah you brought the wheelchair didn't you yeah after you <laughs> I just remember you went around the corner and then I was talking to your mom and then the next thing I know, the, the doctor comes out and is like, okay, we're ready for Josh now. And then you're just gone. So we searched everywhere for you. We go down the hall and there's a bunch of uh, paramedics down the hall. Like, did you see a guy uh, with crutches come through here? They're like, no, we didn't. So you somehow just snuck past all of them, got out the ambulance bay, and were about halfway across the commons when uh, your cousin found you. Yeah, and I remember... Uh, you telling me that like I disappeared and at that time I actually thought that I had the ability depending on like which path I I followed that I actually could really legitimately make myself disappear or make yourself invisible yeah yeah make myself that's essentially what I mean well, make like, myself nobody invisible. saw you and it's not like you know you're you're definitely maybe uh, paramedics see a lot of things I'm sure right and probably more more people with some type of walking aid there than than others, right? So it's not as maybe they just didn't think of it, but it's like holy smokes! You'd think they would have seen you, one of them. Yeah, especially going on these zigzags that I was going on. Yeah, well, you must have. You, I mean, it's a long hallway. They would like had to have gone down the whole hallway. I remember. Yeah, and I wouldn't have even been going straight though, because I would have following all these different shifting paths. <laughs> I I would have been looping back and forth and everything before I. Oh. Uh, before I got out of there and yeah it was just um it was really crazy and I guess for for those that don't know I consider myself uh, a deeply spiritual person and I think that opened up um a lot more of that to me and like but there were so many like I thought like my eyes were flashing like a camera and I could like steal people's souls uh and unintentionally, like I wasn't trying to steal some, but I, I, I'd been given this power somehow and uh, I couldn't control it. And then at another point, I thought like everybody's soul was trapped in my computer. So I didn't know how I could get them out. And then um, right right before I went to the hospital was actually the worst thing because like these, these shadows and stuff were unfolding uh, at the uh, foot of my bed. And it was like a storyline was... was um, developing in front of me and I couldn't quite follow everything but some of them were characters from my life and stuff like that and I was like fuck this I'm going to bed and I heard somebody's voice be like fuck they were pissed off I was going to bed and not following this uh shadow storyline anymore and um at that point these it felt like these little miniature creatures uh came on my leg and just like they were kind of like humping my leg or something and and I thought they were demons, and I thought through their action, they had, like, made me one of them. And now, so, like, every I had this, like, demon infection, and th that I was going to infect everybody I came into contact with, with this demonism or something. So, imagine uh, that, that going through your mind. In the middle of the commons, in a t-shirt, in the middle of winter. <laughs> yeah, just right before the winter solstice. Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, going into your apartment when you were really, really in the thick of it, and it was, it was eerie. Like I was, it was really weird. It weirded me out. I don't get weirded out easily, but like I was, yeah, yeah. Weirded out um, just by me, or did you feel these otherworldly yeah, energies yeah, too? Could, yeah, it felt like I don't know, man. Yeah, there was definitely. I mean, it was also just you were just so drastically different that uh, that that was unnerving. But yeah, you could feel like a thickness in in your in your apartment that I've since not felt. Yeah, I um. I actually called Tonto. That's what I call my mother. For folks that don't know, I call my mother Tonto. Probably the only person in the world who does that. And uh, she, um, I was like, yeah, there's an evil present in the house. I got to get out of here. And she, this is like before I went to the hospital. And she let me like come. And then I felt that the, the presence had followed me. So I'd infected uh, 
uh, their host as well. So there was like nowhere to, to run. And I, I, uh, I just had to face it. And, and it felt like this, this evil was able to get in and, 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 and fuck with me and frighten me because I was so like weakened from the, um, sleep deprivation. And I was, I was, uh, you know, utterly, uh, terrified and, I thought basically like this demon energy could blend with anybody else's. So I wasn't, I thought maybe they could like disguise themselves as like one of my friends or family. So I didn't, I didn't even know that my friends and family was like really them, you know, it could be this, this demon duplication or something. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, it was just, it was very, um, very, very strange. And, uh, I, I, went to the mental hospital for eight days and that was the worst of it because I was seeing these little demons everywhere in the hospital and um, at one point I was in with my friend Croncarella and we we looked at the chalkboard in this like common room and there was a drawing of said de- like the exact type demons I was seeing so other people in there were were uh, obviously experiencing something uh, very similar, but I remember seeing the demons with like lighters, like sort of signifying they were gonna like set fire to things. So like I didn't know if I was gonna be burned alive or like what the fuck. And uh, I was just kind of uh, tra- I was able to talk my way out of it after like eight days. Um, I got uh, discharged and then had to go back a week later, and they still uh, discharged me. But um, for those of you who've been to the mental hospital, uh, it is not safe. Um, I had a woman come at me with a knife, th- thankfully just a plastic knife, but nonetheless. Uh, and, uh, you know, everybody is so out of it. Like at one point I was with Croncarella again, and uh, like the staff had sort of evaluated me as not dangerous. So there was like this lockdown going on and, and uh, me and Croncarella were just chilling another resident woman she asked me do you know what's going on and I'm like no I have no idea and she says are you sure you don't know what's going on like they thought like I was like part of the part of the uh, spies on them like just the whole culture of paranoia and illness um it's not a nice place to be folks so um I guess try to avoid that if you can what was uh what was your impression of the mental hospital in 1942 um yeah, it's, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I shouldn't, uh, <clears throat> the people that work there really mean well, but they have to do everything with their, within certain guidelines, you know, and the space has to look a certain way. You know I mean? I'm all about lighting, right? And if I think if your mental health is, uh, is is uh, is a problem, being on the these fluorescent lighting in this sort of really sterile environment. Uh, I don't see it as being helpful uh, in that sense. But I'm sure you know. I, I have nothing against the staff that would work there. Is all I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Just because uh, I I do know people that that work in those facilities, so they're great. They're great people. But it, yeah, it's I I didn't ever want to stick around there and hang out, you know. No, it it, it is very dreary and very hopeless, and um, of course, uh, me I I'm 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 so big on uh, personal liberty and freedom that you know I I was scared maybe I'd be stuck there forever because I didn't know if I was going to come back. Like 1942 mentioned like you know I wasn't myself. And, things of that nature and I was very drastically different and, and, and I knew that I, I could control it but I, I very well knew that how how weakened I felt and uh, I'm I'm generally a paranoid person um, but I was I mean the paranoia had um, gotten beyond control and I think what happens is um, there were a couple of people I encountered in my life and hadn't really been in contact with either of them for like close to 10 years and but I think I always was like a little bit nervous of of them, and so so that fear uh, really magnified, and it was like the demons or whatever was dark was trying to get at me through these fears. So that's why like I heard these particular people's uh, voices and stuff like that, and I feel like one of them who I've had uh, one of them I actually had contact with, and it turned out to be pretty okay. So that made me uh, feel a lot better. 
Um, but the other one I hadn't had contact with at all. And I got the sense that maybe maybe they were a spirit who had departed and was kind of trapped in the void and maybe even needed my help. But I mean, I don't, I'm not so versed as to guide spirits and things like that. And uh, you apologize to me, folks. If you're, if you're, uh, uh, I apologize, uh, apologize with, uh, bear with me, I mean, because if you have, if you're just a pure atheist with uh, no spiritual beliefs, uh, this kind of thing might not be for you. And I'm, I may just sound, uh, plum nuts, you know, uh, but I, I, I believe there were, there were deep, deep spiritual things going on. And, um, oh yeah, one of the things I wanted to mention too was that, like, they had me on this medication called Abilify, and then and then afterward in shot forms. But this Abilify did not help me at all. Not even one lick. Um, I think it might have made the delusions worse. Uh, it kept me awake, like I still wasn't sleeping on it. You know, maybe I'd I'd knock off like two hours in the night if I was lucky. Um, but it's funny. I did I did Sick Boy and. Uh, after after Sick Boy and a big uh, shout out to those guys, let's say, and a big uh, wish for recovery for for Taylor, um, one of their team who's had a real bad car accident. So I hope he gets better uh, real soon. But uh, after Sick Boy, so Josh, what what is Sick Boy? Oh, Sick Boy is the most uh, famous, I think, podcast in Atlantic Canada. Uh, it's got a wonderful national audience, and the main character is uh named uh, jeremy saunders and he has uh cystic fibrosis and what they aim to do is uh they have guests on um the talk about uh il- illnesses and disabilities and things of that nature but in a positive and humorous light so i was uh lucky enough to be his special guest for the head of the um the atlantic podcast summit and I had uh, 300 people uh, in in the convention center there, down there by the Carlton, and it was uh, it was great because it was like it was my first crowd uh, since I'd gotten sick, right? So, so it was um, it was really cool um, to do that, and, and a big honor that they trust me to be to be on there. Um, but I had a point there about Abilify. So after the show, someone who's a nurse for the IWK, the children's hospital came up to me and they were like, you know what? This, uh, this Abilify is actually the last, uh, resort of medication that we put people on because in, in the children's hospital, because it's so damn harsh. Right. So in my case, that was the uh, first one they put me on. <laughs> so I, I, you can see my, my general paranoid nature again, doesn't really trust, uh, doctors and systems and things of that nature. However, I did get on a better pill. Um, n- no more needles, and that has helped me to sleep. Um, a downside of this is that I'm very groggy, um, and I sometimes aren't able to get out of bed till like like 3 p.m. So uh, I'm just waking up to do this podcast basically at like six in the evening, I guess. Uh, um. So uh, my question: uh, After Sick Boy, uh, what happened to you? Yeah, we. I was just gonna go there actually, yeah. so I'm glad. So, so think about this, folks. I'm I like lose my mind in the middle of December. I have I'm in the mental hospital over Christmas. Uh, but the you know I get out. Um, oh, and I just want to mention too. I was still hearing voices and seeing delusions for till at least February or March, and still very weakened and tired um, till till like April. April pretty much like the mid part of April and so it was four months that were like totally wrecked and uh, we still shot some of the film I'm working on so you can see that and see me breaking down during the film and all that so so this is this is what I'm going through then I do sick boy and it's so funny because um, we like Jeremy is trying to convince me to see a sex worker because I'm talking about dating and difficulties dating and we we go around disability and just the CP being so visible and you know women not being attracted to that and that kind of thing imagine going from like complete mental illness like not not knowing if you're going to get out of it spending time in the mental hospital to you know doing this show that's you know wonderfully attended and has natural national exposure and then all of a sudden, like, uh, 
you guess a girlfriend because they're a big fan of what you said on the show. Like, that's pretty fucking cool, eh? The you couldn't write that story arc better, you know, if you tried. And you filmed it all. That's what blows my mind. Like when you were really bad, I thought, well, this movie is over. It's like we're not, you know, okay, well, that's gonna be gone. And then still kept filming. So we have like this whole thing on on film, which I think I think is what's gonna make your film so cool. On top of uh, everything else. Yeah, like the interviews are really important because yeah, the whole thing is important, right? Right. But now you have this perfect story arc. It's it's uh, it's really mind blowing to me to have gone through it all with you, <laughs> folks. From insanity to romantic bliss and back again. Yeah. Um, was there anything? Uh, any any other sort of insights you had? Or I'm just proud of you, man. I'm happy to have my friend back. That's all I really wanted. So yeah, yeah, he was uh, he was trapped for a bit. I, I wasn't, I was never completely gone, but I was like partially gone. So that's why it was very tricky, and I was I was very aware of everything. But like, oh yeah, and again, you'll know, forgive me for the disorganized uh, nature of this, but I'm just like, because now I remember everything so good. Uh, you got to get it out. I got to get it out, and it's coming out like uh, verbal diarrhea, but I think it'll be quite entertaining to listen to. I, I, I'm enjoying I it. I hope, yeah. And um, so another thing that was going on is like people's uh, faces were flipping around on me. Like they, they weren't looking like themselves, and then like they would like come into focus. And uh, I can relate uh, another specific example of this. I was hearing like inner voices of people that weren't really real, like... Uh, my good buddy Sarah, who uh, works at Charlie's, I remember going down there when I'd been out of the hospital, but I was still, you know, having this psychosis. And, like, she was talking, but then there was this, like, really grovelly voice inside of her that was, like, so I heard, like, screaming, like, stuff like that, right? And so it was, it was, um, it was very hard to uh, navigate. Uh, the world because there was like extra sensory stuff going on on every level i did I, I ever tell you when i got the the old hag or the sleep paralysis and i heard a voice no what, what was that how did what happened there i i was living on i'll keep this quick because i know that's okay this is uh um your hour but just the voices thing i i got uh i, I used to live next to this drum shop and this guy in there was uh We'd hang out and smoke weed and talk about. He used to call me Ghost Man because I was working for a ghost show. But anyway, I was hanging out with him. Got really high, went to sleep, and I woke up and it felt like someone had their hand on my head and whispered in my ear. And it and it that it was that kind of sound. It sounded like a it sounded like a death metal singer. Right, right. Like, like a yeah. but it was kind of gibberish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That, that is exactly what I heard. Yeah. Weird. I know. So it's like, even if these things aren't real, which I kind of think they may be a little bit, at least, um, we're, we're sometimes tuned into the same or very similar frequencies, eh? Yeah, I mean, I, that's what I experienced, right? There could be some scientific explanation for it all, but, and you know, I worked on those TV shows for a long time, and I, you, know, you, you do experience some eerie stuff, like nothing like that you could ever prove scientifically, you you know, but uh, I, I'm I'm always going to be skeptical about everything. But I've definitely experienced some eerie eerie stuff for sure. Yeah, like who knows what the what the source is, right? Like what 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 is actually going on behind that? Um, you know, I'm I'm willing to accept in my case that there was at least somewhat a brain malfunction. I mean, I have brain damage to CP. And I was, you know, doing too much weed, and I definitely was not sleeping. So, and I don't know anybody that's, um, you know, I, it was funny. Like on Sick Boy, when they asked me uh, how long I'd I'd gone without sleep, I was like, eh, a couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> and, and remember, the crowd just like gasped yeah. at that. Yeah, and and, and stress too. Oh, they oh, were, yes, they right. Were stressed I, out. I I had a lot on the go. I was um I was fighting the welfare system over this grant. Um, somebody that I was going to be working with was uh was threatening legal action against me. <laughs> Yikes! Yeah, 
Yikes. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, uh, to that fella, if he ever ends up hearing this, I, I'd just like to question, um, when you threaten legal action against somebody, if they don't work with you, how do you then expect to go work with them after, after you've, you've, you know, how, how, how is that relationship going to be potentially a- any kind of positive? So, so I'd, um, you know, if if you do want to work with somebody in the long run, probably don't threaten to sue them. Might be might be a good idea. You know, I don't know. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, it was just it was a life changing event for me. I'm 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 still kind of haunted by it because I'm, although I'm grateful for what I've achieved and I think I've been very lucky and and from what I've come to understand. Um, from that kind of massive breakdown, my recovery process was actually fairly quick, but I just don't know if it'll happen again sometime, right? So it's always kind of there, and how much it was real, and like, I don't know, like, at one point in the mental hospital, like, I, I was I was reading the Bible, and like... I remember that, and I thought, that's not the best book to be reading right now. <laughs> well, yeah, I thought God could save me, but then there was this other shit, like, saying that, like... I had the mark of the beast and stuff like that, so it was like terrifying. But uh, and I showed uh, Michael there, who's filming. Uh, uh, when I got home, I was still reading the Bible. I didn't do much of the Old Testament. But I read the entire New Testament, which is much uh, smaller. But um, I was having like stigmata, uh, nosebleed experiences on the Bible, and things like I was worrying about, and like one blood like went over like a, a word, and it was like it said, uh, "Your sins are forgiven, Josh." And I was like, "Oh, okay, that sounds good." <laughs> and like, there's just pages covered in uh, blood. You sure you were doing push-ups? No, yeah, when I made myself bleed from doing push-ups, that's right. I, I got too drunk, did a bunch of push-ups one time. and uh, got Drunk out front thing. of Charlie's. Yeah, yeah. In front of a bunch of ladies. Josh is like, I'm going to do a bunch of push-ups. I'm going to do a million push-ups. And I did. He did a lot, and then, and then <laughs> he goes down to do one more, and all this blood shoots out of your nose onto the concrete. And we're like, holy shit. Man, that was that was good. We were quite drunk. <laughs> like yeah, like I said, Charlie's Club Tuesday yeah. nights. Oh, even man. if you make some real bad decisions, you won't go broke making it. You complete on the concrete, but you'll still have money in your pocket. Yeah, you did do like thirty push-ups or something. Something was, like that. That was impressive, man. You were getting up there. I think I think you were still going, but then your toes started bleeding. Yeah, I was like, ah, fuck and this. I'm bleeding. Had to stop. Yeah, yeah. Got to stop, folks. I'm bleeding. Sorry. Oh, my God. Hope you enjoyed the show, though. That was classic, man. Those people didn't know what to think. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, since I brought this up at the beginning of the show, I'm curious, uh, what's your thoughts on these uh, disability organizations going around to disabled people and trying to get them to work for free? That's your department, brother. I I mean, obviously, if that's what's happening... uh, not not good practice if they're yeah people i i really do think that uh a lot of the stuff you get asked to do you should be compensated something for it uh even just like an honorarium you know exactly uh yeah like the sick boy guys you know yeah they they were very good about that right yeah and you know what that's worth mentioning yeah yeah they they uh they really hooked me up and they they didn't have to um i'm reticent if we should say this because if other guests of theirs may no, no, no. I mean, no. Yeah, maybe we could cut that out. Yeah, that was a that was a special show. Though. That was a special show. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, and, like it's hard. It's hard for you, man. Like it, it's, <laughs> you know, it's hard for you to get like to get there and to be there is, uh, yeah. And you stole the show, by the way. Oh so. yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I I listened to it, and because their stage mics were so good, um, unfor- unfortunately, I felt it didn't pick up. Uh, the crowd noise problem. That's my only critique of the whole thing. Nothing against the boys. Uh, they did beautiful. They asked uh, wonderful questions and, and put on a good show. But you couldn't uh, glean, I don't think, from the from uh, the the audio recording of that, how much the crowd was actually responding to us. Yeah, I I, I haven't uh, listened to it yet. Uh, but being there, yeah, there was definitely that was definitely part of the experience. Would have been to hear them for sure. Yeah, because it was audible. Yeah, they were so receptive, right? There's like 300 people there. I know. And, big room. Yeah, and that's what I mean. 300 people and, you know, making noise, right? 
not yeah. uh, not 300 people in deadly which kind of sounds like on the audio records like all these people and you can't really hear them so it's like yeah kind of sounds like the jokes are missing and stuff but they but they weren't no they weren't you nailed it yeah 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 um i think that's pretty much it except to say um a couple of things i i want to say that if um if people listen to this and have questions like uh please uh post them on our when we get it up on youtube because uh, the other channels are kind of ripping us off, only putting uh, certain episodes on, stuff like that. But but ev- everything of Gimp Nane Easy is on the Gimp Nane Easy uh, YouTube channel. And if you folks have uh, questions about uh, what I went through or, you know, my stance on uh, disability organizations. And, and let me say, too, it's it like it's a different thing if it's another disabled person or, you know, if they're not you know, if they're not making any money or the person that's contacting me is a volunteer. But like, if your organization is paying you a fucking living wage to go do this, and then as part of that living wage, you're deciding, oh, well, we need to get disabled people on here and we can't pay them. I think there's something criminally, should be criminally uh, wrong with that. It's just it's just uh, very unseemly, you know? But uh yeah, if anybody has has questions uh, for us or me, you know, put put them on the the YouTube comments. Of this uh, this thing, maybe maybe we'll do another follow up episode where I uh, answer your questions about all these uh, uh, delusions and voices and uh, and 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 ultimately uh, recovery. And uh, I want to thank 1942 for being here doing this special show on location at his place. And yeah. what, oh, go ahead. No, I said yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, motherfucker. And I want to thank uh, Michael for filming. And uh, i like to send a little special uh, shout out to uh, Amanda. That's uh, my special lady. I uh, hope she's feeling well. I hope she enjoyed the show. And uh, I'll talk to you real soon. Folks, I've been Josh Dunn. He's been 1942. And... Uh, we got an invisible Michael in the background. This has been Gimpin' Ain't Easy, because it ain't episode number 22. And remember, like I tells you always, especially when you're feeling down, you look yourself in the mirror, you give yourself that Ric Flair. Woo! Because you are the greatest of all time. I know I am. Good night.